was looking at our scripture reading from this week, earlier on in the week, and it seemed to me that this particular scripture reading pointed naturally to accountability and talking about accountability. Now, accountability issues are not always fun. It's not always fun to be dealing with that, but I think we can all agree that it's, it's necessary. It's something that we, we have to do. And in this world that we live in now, in the culture that we live in, it seems like more and more any aspects of accountability are kind of going to the wayside. You do whatever you want to do. And that's not a godly thing. It's not a godly way to live. God has given us his Bible, this written word, his holy word. And in the Bible, we have a plan on how we're supposed to live in this world. And some of the plan is indeed that we're supposed to hold each other accountable. We get some specific advice about that. Today, in our scripture reading specifically, I believe it's telling us how we are supposed to hold other believers accountable whenever they sin against us, whenever they sin against us. We're going to look at these words from the scripture from this morning, and we're going to look at some other words that Jesus said right around these words today. So that maybe we get a bigger picture or a more complete picture of just what Jesus is saying to us. I invite you to open up your your Bible, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to be looking at all of chapter 18 is what we're going to be doing. So I invite you, if you have a Bible, to grab one there and open that up and we can follow along. As you're doing that, try to set the mood a little bit. I want to give you an illustration on how maybe we're not supposed to hold each other accountable. It's a It's an old joke. It comes from a guy named Van Morris, and it goes like this. He's writing to his friend Frank. Dear Frank, we've been neighbors for six tumultuous years. When you borrowed my tiller, you returned it in pieces. When I was sick, you blasted rap music. And when your dog went to the bathroom all over my lawn, you laughed. I could go on, but I'm certainly not one to hold grudges. So I'm writing you this letter to tell you that your house is on fire. Cordially, Bob. (laughs) That's not the way we're supposed to do Christian accountability for sure, but you know, I thought. We want to look at uh, chapter 18 is what we're going to be looking at. And like I said, we're going to look at all of Jesus' words. Jesus is doing a lot of speaking here. And we're going to talk about accountability. Accountability for me personally is a very important thing. I really think it's something that uh, we as a church, the bigger church, need to be doing a better job at. We uh, we're seem to be falling away from that a little bit. There are thinkers out there, there are speakers and preachers and other folks who always speak about grace and forgiveness, and I think we can all agree that's really good stuff. <laughs> we all want some of that for sure. But it makes me a little nervous whenever we lean completely on that and kind of forget about what God is saying in His Word and God's uh, accountability and and what's going on in the Bible, God's rules. I I don't think it's a godly thing when we forget those things. So when I was looking at this scripture this week, this is the question that kind of came to me. How do we believers and followers of Jesus balance the incredible gift of godly delivered amazing grace for all of God's children with godly accountability to the word of God revealed to us through the Holy Scriptures? That's the question that kind of came to me when I was looking at the, at the scripture from uh, this week. Here, in the scripture reading that we have from this morning, it is very clear, coming from the mouth of Jesus himself, that at some point, some point, if our brother is sinning against us and refuses to deal with it, we are supposed to treat them as a pagan or a tax collector. That last part was really interesting because Matthew was a tax collector. He wrote the Gospel of Matthew. I thought that was really it. That's a whole other sermon. We'll get to that later. A whole other sermon. But you can see it. I mean, in in the scripture reading from this morning, from Jesus' words himself, this is what we're supposed to do. We need to listen to Christ. We absolutely need to listen to Christ. But you know what? There's a whole bunch of other words from Jesus himself right around our scripture reading from this morning. We need to listen to them also, right? All of God's words, right? So I want to look at some of these other words 
Because when I was looking at that this week, and I was reviewing what Christ said throughout the chapter of 18, Matthew 18, it seemed to me that Jesus was trying to, in some ways, hold us accountable for us holding others accountable. Does that make sense? Need an arrow to follow that a little bit. But it seemed that way for me. So we want to look at this. Accountability can be a tough thing. It can be a scary thing. But it's a necessary thing. And when we look at accountability and look more specifically for Christian accountability, we need to turn to Christ, don't we? When we look at Jesus' words, we get the complete picture of Christian accountability. So that's where we're at. That's where we're going to start. This will be fun, right? We're going to do this in 20 minutes. Right? We can do that, right? Let's go back to the beginning of chapter 18. And it starts off like this. In the beginning of chapter 18, we find the disciples coming to Jesus and asking him a very pressing question on their minds. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now let's just stop right there. Here we have the disciples, right? Worrying about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, that's a little selfish, isn't it? <laughs> it's a little, child, little childish if you really stop and think about it. So Jesus, reacting to that like he does, brings a child into the middle of the situation, brings a child right there and stands in between himself and the disciples. And then he says this in verses 3 and 5. I tell you the truth, unless you change, okay, unless you change, speaking to the disciples, and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. That's some heavy-duty words right there, isn't it? Speaking to the disciples. Therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. Now, why are we looking at these words whenever we're talking about accountability. This is a point I want to make. I think not only are Jesus' words and God's words very, very important, but I also believe the positioning of Jesus' words is very, very important. I don't think this particular part of Scripture was put here by accident. And I think this part of Scripture reflects to the Scripture that we're reading this morning with our with our, uh, with our scripture reading from this morning. I think it was put there specifically. In just a little bit, as we go through chapter 18, Jesus will be talking about sin. Talking about sin and some other heavy duty things. But here at the beginning, Jesus is trying to make a point. And the point is this. We need to make sure, I believe, whenever we're dealing with accountability issues, that we approach them in a childlike manner and not a childish manner, like the disciples were. We can't approach any kind of accountability issue trying to make ourselves look good relative to other folks around us. That's not what it's about. We need to approach it with obedience in mind, childlike obedience to what God has in mind. First point I'd like to lift up. Let's move on to verse 7. Verse 7 we hear, these words from Jesus. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. Now, this verse, I think, is telling us that we certainly don't want to lead anyone into sinful behavior. Children or even people young in the faith, I think we can go and, and stretch that a little bit. We don't want to be leading children or those young in the faith into sin. As we hold somebody, a brother or sister in Christ, accountable, we have to make sure that we're doing it without modeling sinful behavior. Okay? Now, what do I mean by that? We need to do it without pride, without prejudice, without envy, without slander, all of those things. As we're doing the work that we have to do with Christian accountability, we have to make sure that we're not doing it, modeling any kind of sinful behavior, leading others towards sin. I think that's the second point that we want to make out from this particular scripture. God is indeed for all of us, right? He's not against us. God is for us. And God wants all of his sheep back into the church. That kind of leads to the third thing. 
A third thing that we see in our gospel writing, it's the, uh, the parable of, of the lost sheep, a very familiar one. Uh, the, the verses are there, verses 10 through 14. And we can see in that particular parable, Jesus telling the parable, how important each and every one of his sheep is to, to himself. Nine, he had 100 sheep, 99 were there, one left. The guy went to get the one. <laughs> he went to get the one. Put the 99 to the side. God has a desire for all of his children to be with him in his house. If they sin, if they go away, we're supposed to go there. I think it's very significant that this is right before our scripture reading from this morning. I think he was put there to emphasize the fact that even though there might come a time in our accountability with a brother or sister sinning against us, where we have to treat them like a, like a tax collector, that might happen. But ultimately, God wants all of his sheep back into the church. Ultimately, God wants to restore everybody to the church, loving them through any kind of accountability issues. In the end, that might not be possible. It just might not be possible. But we need to try. We need to try. And that brings us to this morning's scripture. <clears throat> We've been talking about this morning's scripture. I want to lift up two other things from this morning's scripture. First of all, the scripture starts off like this. If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. And then you go forward through our, this morning's scripture. If you do it one-on-one -on -one and they don't uh, see that they're sinning, well, then you need to go and get a couple witnesses and go through the same process. If that doesn't work, you take it to the church, and then you do the teeter like a, a tax collector deal. The point is... The first point I want to make is it seems like Jesus is giving this advice to us for our church, for the church. Maybe not necessarily those outside the church, but I think Jesus has given us this advice for members of the church. Second point I want to uh, talk about from our scripture reading from this morning is this, is the seriousness of this process of accountability, the seriousness of this. Jesus says this. I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Christian accountability deals with sin. Sin separates you and I from God. Unrepentant sin, not turned over to Jesus, leads to eternal damnation. Not a good thing. Not a good thing at all. We as the redeemed must do everything that we possibly can to help those who may be turned away from God to re repent and turn back to the church. We're talking about people's very souls here and their eternal lives. We have to do everything that we possibly can. Leads to the final uh, words from Christ that I want to look at today. It's the parable of the unmerciful servant after our scripture reading. It's verses 21 through 35. And I think in these particular words from Christ, we get some more good godly advice concerning our attitude whenever we approach someone with accountability, whenever we do Christian accountability. First of all, in this particular part of the scripture, we see that Peter and Jesus is having a conversation. Peter asked Jesus how many times he's supposed to forgive his brother who sinned against him, seven times? That was the norm. That was the Mosaic law, forgive him seven times. And Jesus answers back, no, 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 not seven. <laughs> Seventy times seven. Now, I don't think Christ has given us a specific number there. I think what Christ is saying, you need to do it a whole bunch. <laughs> you need to do it a, a whole bunch. You need to approach any kind of uh, Christian accountability with a mindset of forgiveness. You need to approach it with the idea of forgiving 70 times 7. Jesus goes on to illustrate why we should have this mindset as he tells the parable of the unmerciful servant. You probably remember back, but let's just talk about it a little bit. King decides that one of his servants and he need to settle their debt. And the servant comes to the king and it's found out that the servant owes the king 10,000 talents. Well, how much is 10,000 talents? 
my research this week, this is how 10,000 talents looks like. 10,000 talents is equal to, listen to this, 160,000 years worth of wages for the average worker of that time. It's a whole bunch of money. 160,000 years worth of wages for the average worker of that time. Obviously, the servant can't pay that. So the king says, you know what we're going to do? We're going to sell your family. We're going to sell everything at your own so we can start to pay off this debt. But the servant falls to his knees and begs the king for a little bit more time to pay the debt that he's never going to be able to pay. The king not only forgives him, but he forgives the debt. 160,000 years worth of wages the king just wipes from the book. It's kind of like you and I going to God and asking for forgiveness of our sins. We can never pay it, but God forgave us anyhow. Right? As the parable continues, this same servant who was forgiven goes out into the world and he finds another servant, a fellow servant, who owes him 100 denarii. How much is 100 denarii? That's 100 days worth of wages for the average worker of that time. 100 days. The second servant begs the first servant to give him a little bit more time so he can pay off his debt. But the first servant says no. He grabs him and he says no. Pay me what you need to pay me now. And he can't. So he sent the jail. Sent the debtor prison. And then the king finds out about this. Finds out what the servant that he forgave just did. And he's not happy. Not happy at all. And he decides to do some things. Verses 34 through 35. In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Remember, he owed 160,000 years worth of wages. That's eternal damnation, folks. That's what that is, right? The king turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he paid back all that he owed. Jesus goes on to say this, This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. As we approach any kind of accountability issues that we need to approach, we need to remember where we come from and how forgiven we are. There's nothing else we have to do to pay the debt that you and I have accrued because Jesus has paid it. We need to pass that same thing on to others. We need to have a heart of forgiveness. We need to remember that this is what Christ is telling us. Okay? Accountability can be a tricky business. It can be hard to do. It can be scary to do. But ultimately, it must be done. We need to make sure that we do it in a Christian-like manner. We have to do Christian accountability. We need to use Jesus and Jesus' words as our very guide as we do it. And if we do it in that way, good can come out of it. When we get to the other side, good can happen. Let me share with you an illustration that kind of speaks to all of this from a Christian businessman named John D. Beckett. And he shares this story. I was in a dental chair being prepped for a replacement of a filling. Just as my mouth was filled with dental hardware so I could only mumble, the dental technician said out of the blue, you're Mr. Beckett, aren't you? I grunted assent. Well, I don't want to thank you for firing my husband. <laughs> Imagine yourself in a dental chair. <laughs> You're kind of at the mercy. He says, I was stuck. I couldn't move. I couldn't speak. I could only listen to the ensuing monologue. It happened 10 years ago, she said. A few days after your company hired my husband, he was notified he failed a drug test. You might not recall. She continued. But you called him into your office before he left, and you said, I realize I don't have any choice but to terminate you, but I want to tell you something. You're at a crossroads. You can keep going the way that you are, and the results are very predictable, or you can take this as a wake-up call. You can decide you're going to turn your life around. The author goes on to say, I'm sure the technician couldn't see the beads of perspiration on my forehead under all the paraphernalia, as she continued. <laughs> 
I want you to know, my husband took your advice. Today, he's a good father, a good husband, and he has a fine job. Thank you for firing my husband. <laughs> he writes, I wish I could say that all our terminations had turned out this way. Regardless of the outcome, however, we must be prepared to take action when a situation can't be brought around. In a strange way, it's an aspect of our care for our people. Same goes for us, right? As we hold each other in Christian accountability, it's an aspect of how much we love each other and how much we want to help each other get better and better. We just need to make sure that as we do accountability, we do it as Jesus tells us, as Jesus sets it up. We need to listen to all of Christ's words. From this morning's sermon, this is the way I interpret chapter 18. We need to do a couple things. We need to approach Christian accountability in a childlike manner, being obedient only to God and not approach it in a childish manner a self-serving manner where we're trying to make ourselves look good relative to the other folks in the church or something like that. We need to second, as we hold other people accountable, we need to make sure that our sin doesn't push these folks in sinful ways. We need to make sure that we're not being prideful or, being, or dealing with prejudice or any kind of slander or any kind of those things as we're dealing with uh, Christian accountability. We need to remember that God wants all of his sheep all 100 back into the church. Ultimately, that's the goal. We need to remember Jesus in his word today is speaking to us as a church, and we need to remember that this is serious business, right? We're talking about people's very souls here. So we need to make sure that we're doing that. And we need to approach any kind of Christian accountability with the proper attitude. We need to be forgiving. We need to remember how much we are forgiven. And we need to strive to pass that along. If we do all those things, we can love ourselves and love our, our church into becoming more and more like Christ. And indeed, that is what is needed. So let's be about accountability. Let's do it the way Christ has set it up. Amen? Amen.